political. It's unfortunately it has become politicized, but it's a matter of fact. Climate pollution, corporate polluters that set a blanket of pollution in the air that is overheating our planet, contributed, caused the conditions that led to this fire. In addition, there's mismanagement of land. The original big five oligarchy in Hawaii, missionary families that took over our economy and government, they continue on today as some of our largest political donors and landowners and corporations. They've been grabbing land and diverting water away from this area for a very long time now, for generations. And Lahaina was actually a wetland. You could take a, like Viola church, you could have boats circulating the church back back in the day um but you know because they needed water for their corporate ventures like golf courses and hotels and monocropping um that that has ended so the natural form of lahaina we have never caught on fire these disasters are anything but natural so yes colonial greed in the fact that they caused the pollution that warmed our planet and set hurricanes like this to become the norm and the gross mismanagement of our land and water, which the Green New Deal actually is about returning both, um, you know, both mitigating climate change, building resilience, but also returning the stewardship of land and water to the people. Can you talk about the dry land right now? I mean, you have uh, Hurricane Dora hundreds of miles away. Um, the wind was intense. Uh, but the drought that existed, that relationship to climate change. Yeah, that's right. So we, growing up on this island, we saw maybe one or two fires, and they're very contained when things got to this drought factor. It's never been anything close to this. This shock even... Even like the climate scientists that I've worked with over the years were, were shocked by this, by this fire. And a lot of it has to do with these dry conditions. Growing up, my dad would drive us to church and he'd point out to the sugar cane and he'd say, but when you're my age, all the sugar cane would be gone. And I was like, you know, okay, sure. Uh, this is, it's such a central part of Maui, but he was right. The sugar is gone. And the reason why is because one of these big five oligarchical uh, corporations that I spoke of knew that the sugar wasn't profitable, but they continued monocropping most of the island in order to get some tax breaks for agriculture. Now, I grew up in a, in a community where it would rain cane, cane ash on us, and it was like fun. I didn't realize we we're all getting asthma. We say an environmental justice community. Um, so, but you know, there were people that fought against the cane burning. Um, and the corporation ended up blaming the activists uh, for the for the sugar shutting down, pitting the union workers against the community. Um, the result now is just like a fallow, really dry land um, across the whole central valley of our island. Um, and really, if you know, if community members and union members were to unite and have been organized uh, years ago, um, we could have had a much different future. Uh, and uh, that's still something uh, that I think we we should continue working to build is that is that labor and uh, environmental uh, unity. Can you talk about the April survey of homeless people, unhoused people? I think it was something like 704 unhoused people in Maui County, among them 244 suffering from mental health disabilities. The unhoused crisis among Native Americans, uh, Native Hawaiians, and what do you know about Native Hawaiians uh, who were unhoused and how the wildfires have affected them? Yeah, um, I think there's a certain perception of Native Hawaiians who are unsheltered. Um, that's not that does not fit with reality. Some of the unsheltered Hawaiian communities that continue today were occupations of land that was getting seized, um, and they're like, "Look, if we we don't want to cooperate with this with this new." extractive economy that y'all created. So we're going to live on by ourselves in our own community on this beach. We're going to uh, govern ourselves and they're quite organized and they're living in a way that's subsistent and in harmony with nature. Now it's not to be glamorized. 
a lot of a lot of these folks face some really dire conditions not being a part of this um, capitalist system. But a lot of them are doing it based on really strong and sensible beliefs. Um, now, when a climate crisis hits, uh, when a disaster hits, it's going to impact these people first and worse, uh, no doubt. And we need to make sure that both relief and recovery efforts in the longer term um, are prioritizing um, the low income um, and indigenous people that that are some some are still unaccounted for. Some don't even have IDs, um, and we, and you know they need to be front of mind with it with everything we do uh, from you know day zero when the disaster breaks to years out when we're recovering. The wildfires occurred on the same day that President Biden said in an interview that he had practically declared a climate emergency, but he has not actually formally done that. What would that mean? Yeah, um, I've just been frantically trying to make sure that my loved ones are okay, but I also work on climate. This is my job. And I, as soon as I start thinking about that statement from President Biden, I just get so incensed. This is a climate emergency. There's no practical, practically declared it. You either believe it or not. And I think as bad as Republicans have been by denying climate, Democrats are just as culpable by, by not doing enough. Scientists say that we need to be investing at least $1 trillion a year in the clean energy transition. We need to end and phase out, deny all new fossil fuel permits, and, and really re empower the communities to build back ourselves democratically. That's, that's the solution for it. And President Biden announced his second term, but he hasn't told us how he's going to finish the job. He needs to lay out that vision, what we've been demanding from a Green New Deal, if he wants communities that got him elected to come out, that base of climate voters that happen to be predominantly Black, Indigenous, and low-income people. Like We need something forward-looking to come out, because right now, like... I'm not even thinking about voting, right? Like nobody in Lahaina is thinking about whether or not they support Biden. Like give us something, you know, at least let us see, be seen. Uh, so, you know, I think that's that sense of urgency. Even even me who, who is in this climate work full time and see these events unfold elsewhere, until it hits you at home and it's people you know, grocery stores you shop at, schools your kids go to, your church actually being burnt down, you're not going to understand the urgency. Like it is shocking. And we're not talking 10 years from now. We're having these things are happening right now. It could happen to your home tomorrow. That's the urgency we're dealing with. And we need to act accordingly. So, no, practically speaking, like we need to move now and do everything we can. And can you tell us more about the importance of indigenous wisdom and practices in addressing the climate catastrophe? Sure. Yeah. So going into line of the people that actually live there for generations are the keepers of some of the most profound indigenous knowledge that I have ever met. Um, they understood subsistence fishery, um, how native plants were buffers against like, you know, disasters, uh, how to, um, you know, create regenerative agricultural practices. Uh, and it's that, it's that view of the world where, um, you know, our success isn't determined by how much we hoard, but, but rather how much we produce for others and share and where like our, um, our economy is, is not based on how well the rich are doing, but how, 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 how many people, how many of us can actually thrive. Like it's that it's, it's not just indigenous knowledge, but it's that value system that really needs to be, um, reestablished. So, you know, I think over the years, especially in, in my line of work, there's been more resources 
for indigenous folks to lead frontline fights against bad projects. But the intervention that really needs to happen is indigenous leaders also need to be resourced to build the good. They need to be the purveyors of and architects of the the new green and like uh, community rooted world that, that that's still possible, even in these dire times. Finally, would you like to leave us with some images that you have been living through over these last few days, like the banyan tree, where you show us uh, uh, when you um, uh, put out on social media the before and after the wildfires, but other images or stories of people's bravery and trying to preserve um, what you have known for so long? Yeah, I mean, as as we're speaking, there's people that still haven't found their loved ones. Um, a lot of the friends that I grew up with, like I come from a lower income neighborhood, they're firefighters. I ran into one on the way here and I'm just like, hey, you are doing a great job. And he was just sweating and like started crying and, you know, barely looked like he hadn't slept in days. Uh, hotels are letting residents in without cost to sleep. Um, multiple businesses are just letting people drop off goods and they're shipping it three to four times a day. They're leaving their doors open 24 hours. So there is that sense of, you know, this is an island. We're all in this together. And um, that sense of mutual aid and solidarity is really carrying us through. Um, and it, it's been it's been quite remarkable to witness. Um, but, you know, don't want to leave you with some toxic positivity either. Like these are hard times. And unless we take urgent action now, um, it'll only get worse. And what is the, do you feel is the most important thing that President Biden, the federal government, uh, people should be pushing for right now? Well, right now we need direct aid, but there needs to be a longer focus on um, recovery that these we can't rebuild the community in a few weeks. It's going to take years and we need to do it intentionally, not just making sure, not just bringing us back to the status quo because the status quo is what led us here, but making sure that we have more democratic and community controlled uh, institutions that come out of this. Unfortunately, the groups that are best poised to deploy direct aid because of their institutional connections are also the most likely to enable disaster capitalists from exploiting this situation. Um, so we need to create, we need to understand that, you know, as we're like trying, as people want to help, that they're uh, resourcing groups that have an eye um, towards community organizations to, to to organizers that will actually be there once the cameras leave and we'll be rebuilding uh, from the ground up over the course of the long run. And one more time, can you tell us why the banyan tree is so important? Yeah. I mean, the banyan tree is, is so iconic. There's like 16 trunks. It's the largest in the United States. It just turned 150 years old in April. And the images of it being completely toasted is heartbreaking. Now I have hope because trees have deep roots, especially of that age, that it will continue on. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the vision in my mind, right? Like as we rebuild as a community, as we realize the vision of a green new deal nationally and globally, um, the banyan tree also regrows its leaves and is a positive symbol for what's to come. Kaniela Ng, the national director of the Green New Deal Network, seventh generation Native Hawaiian, speaking to us from Maui. And I especially thank my little pup, Zazu, for staying quiet during that interview, which makes me think about all of the fauna and the flora destroyed as well uh, on Maui, and of course, most importantly, the people.